Welcome to the International Myeloma Workshop in Boston. Um, I'm joined by um, two of my good colleagues, Mary V. Mateus and Saji Kumar. And we've um, recently attended the um, session on myeloma precursor conditions. And so we're going to chat with you a little bit about some of the interesting things that um, we found. I should start by saying we had the privilege of it being chaired by Dr. Kyle, and he gave us a really um, fascinating introduction as to how these conditions have changed over his lifetime, which now spans over 50 years of looking at um, um, muggers and other conditions such as that. Saji, Recently, you've been involved in the, some of the new definitions of smouldering myeloma and MGUS. Can you just expand on that a little bit and some of the discussions we had yesterday? Right. So in terms of the diagnostic criteria, I think that's where obviously some of the changes have happened in the past few years. And that is a paradigm shift because we, for the longest time, said we shouldn't treat anybody without any crap features or end organ damage. And when the International Myeloma Working Group redefined myeloma, we looked at a slice of patients with smoldering myeloma who were at extremely high risk of progression, um, defined as more than 80% in two years, and said, you know, there's no point really waiting for the other shoe to drop, literally speaking, uh, before we start a therapy. So we took those patients and put them into the bucket of active myeloma that needs uh, treatment. That is the expanded definition for myeloma. But it also that mean, you know, meant that we had to redefine smoldering myeloma, uh, taking these patients out of that um, group uh, who were previously considered as smoldering. So it's a kind of a cascade effect, so that, which also meant that we, now we had to redefine how we uh, assess the risks of progression to active myeloma among those patients. And that is um, effort that we have been involved in the International Myeloma Working Group to try and redefine the risk stratification for small ring disease. Fantastic. Marivy, you were talking about the, the new buzzword, the myeloma 2020. Is that the, the expression? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, this is uh, in line with uh, the Saji's comment because uh, we try to redefine the criteria for the identification of high-risk smoldering myeloma, those with a 50% risk of progression at two years. And I think that the main objective of the project was to focus on the identification of these patients. And uh, well, we collected the baseline data from more than 2,000 smoldering myeloma patients worldwide. And when we did the statistical analysis in the univariate analysis and in the multivariate analysis, the serum and protein higher than two grams per deciliter, more than 20% of plasma cells, and serum free light chain ratio higher than 20, emerged as independent prognostic factor predicting 50% risk of progression to myeloma. And with these three factors, we decided to build a prognostic model in which uh, it's interesting to see that uh, approximately one third of the patients uh, did not present any factor. And the risk of progression to myeloma was really very, very low. We had uh, approximately another third uh, of patients, 30% of patients with uh, just one of the risk factors. And uh, the risk of progression to myeloma was approximately 20 plus uh, something at two years. And finally, a subgroup of patients with two or more of these three features, 220 or 20, in which the risk of progression to myeloma was 50%. In addition, we evaluated the role of cytogenetic abnormalities because uh, it was not a part of the first analysis because, well, you can imagine that uh, not all patients had uh, the cytogenetic information. But, uh, well, it was interesting because at the end we collected the data of approximately 600, almost 70, 700 patients with the smoldering with uh, 2, 20, 20 plus uh, cytogenetic information. And the cytogenetic information added an additional value to the model. And uh, when uh, cytogenetic, inform cytogenetic abnormalities were presented together with uh, two or three of the risk factors, the risk of progression to myeloma was a bit higher of 50%, approximately 67% at two years. Is this the ideal model? Well, maybe no. Is an available model around the world? The answer is yes, because the serum and protein, the plasma cell bone marrow infiltration, and the free light chain ratio are available 
in, I would say, almost all centers. And this is the main concept, as Saji is here, that is also PI of this project. This is the main objective. Well, in the future, many cooperative groups, many companies are going on with proposals, with clinical trials in high-risk smothering. So we have to try to, to define the high-risk smothering in a homogeneous way, and this is the main objective. No, that's great. So it's 2220 that exactly. we need to, the new buzzwords we need to remember, yeah? So um, it was quite interesting. One of the questions somebody asked actually was around, I don't know if you remember, was around um, the new definition of myeloma, including those high light chains levels and whether that is something that you should just measure at the diagnosis and what's the prognostic value if you've been following somebody with light chains uh, over you know, a long period of time. And it was made quite clear that all of these models are just the first time you see the patient. Yeah. And that sometimes, yes, we all agree, you may have a patient who's stable for many years, but it's this prognostic value at the beginning. I think the, the model, as we just said, I think the time of diagnosis, we certainly need to have more variables to define what if this patient has been observed for three years, now how do we define high risk? And I think that's where some of those evolving phenotype um, things come in, um, especially the increase in the M spike, the decrease in hemoglobin that has been used to define the evolving type of uh, small ring. Excellent. As you say, one of the talks that um, then taking on with that cytogenetics was some of the new data um, about the um, sequencing and so on. I don't, did you take, have any take home comments from that? I think eventually um, they will have to be part of the model. I think we have relied extensively on the quantitative aspects um, in terms of the M spike and you know, the, the, the levels of free light chain. But the genomics are going to play an important part as Mario already pointed out, adding the fish data to the um, the 20 to 20 already seem to have you know, added some benefit to it. But the key thing is distinguishing the truly malignant plasma cell from maybe not that bad a plasma cell. And I think that's where some of the newer techniques like either single cell sequencing mm -hmm. or some of the you know specific abnormalities like MIC abnormality that was yeah. shown. So they all can play a role by adding on to this. So we'll have a model that is not just quantitative, estimation, but a qualitative estimation of where the clone is.